<laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you, Philippe. Thank you so much. Thank you also for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here um, in this institute, which I, I gather is patterned after the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So I think it's fitting that, uh, that we talk about information theory today, <laughs> comma, information theory, comma, today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because, you know, being a, being a joint venture or being an effort that is funded by Nokia uh, in a scientific institute, I think this fits very well. Because as you saw uh, uh, in Aspect's uh, talk, uh, you saw a uh, Claude Shannon's picture before. So information theory came from, uh, from Bell Labs. Okay, and yeah, now Bell Labs, after many changes in ownership, is owned by by Nokia. All right, so um, I'll, I'll give you a very uh, kind of broadband type of talk um, without getting into any particular details uh, because I know that the audience is heterogeneous, so I don't want to bore you with uh, a lot of details, but hopefully give you a good, um, a good feeling for what this discipline uh, is like. All right, so of course, it has to do uh, with technology, and uh, so let me give you now a few of the main highlights of what are the technologies under the preview of, uh, of information theory. So, you know, you name it, any, you know, Wi-Fi, um, satellite communication. By the way, satellite played a very important role in the development of uh, of information theory because it was really the first application where you had very low signal to noise ratio channels and you wanted uh, very high reliability and that's when uh, where Shannon theory was really first applied. Um, you know you go to the uh, internet uh, access through copper wires through, through coaxial cable so on um, plain old telephone uh, uh, fax uh, systems, um, Skype, uh, you know, you want to do exactly the opposite operation that you do in, 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 the, in the fax. In the fax you convert bits to sounds, in Skype you convert sounds to bits. Um, and uh, also, you know, storage technologies, digital storage technologies like the CD, the DVD, uh, the blue rate, uh, there the communication is happening not across um, uh, <coughs> uh, space but across time. Okay, so uh, digital storage of movies or, uh, or uh, images that converts video into bits, digital cameras uh, converting uh, images into bits, uh, hard disks also there is a technology that uh, you have to, it's, it's a purely digital channel if you want, but there is also um, impairments co caused by fingerprints or by dust or um, imperfections in the disks. And here another technology, uh, this would be a picture from uh, one of these Amazon um, big data centers uh, and really the main cost in running these centers is air conditioning. Uh, so, so information theory comes to the rescue in, in cutting your bill for, for air conditioning and we'll, uh, we'll see why. Um, or technologies for compressing information, WinZip, uh, PDF files, uh, all those are uh, technologies found in every operating system and, uh, and we'll see what is the role of information theory there. All right, so that gives you a, a whole panoply of technologies and now we're going to see how mathematics actually relates to these technologies, okay? So, um, so really, uh, you know, if we are where we are in all the technologies that I, that I, uh, that I showed, if we are where we are, is really thanks to mathematics. Of course, physics also gets a, a, a distinguished second place uh, uh, because, uh, you know, it enables you to do what mathematics tells you 
uh, to do, you can do it faster, you can do it smaller, you can do it with less power, and so on. But uh, physics is not going to tell you what to do with the chips. It's really mathematics. All right? So it's, it's really, uh, uh, it's really uh, the triumph of mathematics. And that's, it's exciting because you get to see you know, the, the power and beauty uh, of the subject at the service of technologies that we use every day. All right, so most sciences develop gradually, right? So there is uh, layer upon layer upon layer of contributions. Well, and very few sciences really have a birthday, uh, but information theory does have a birthday, and, uh, and that's 1948. And it's really no exaggeration to say that information theory came out of nowhere. It was completely new. It was really the brainchild of a genius, Claude Shannon, who uh, uh, not only solved uh, the main challenges, but actually he posed what the main challenges were uh, back then in 1948. And it took a long time before technology was able to, to develop so that what he predicted back then had actually something to say, something relevant to say about the practical world. All right, so this is, this is his paper in preprint form, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, uh, the Magna Carta of the Information Age. And uh, here's the first paragraph of, um, of the paper, where already in the first paragraph it's very much motivated by technology, PCM, PPM, exchange of bandwidth for signal to noise ratio and so on, even though the paper uh, was really a, a mathematical paper, although he sent it to a journal, the Bell System Technical Journal, which was not really a journal read by mathematicians, it was really a journal read by engineers. So he didn't, he didn't put every detail of every proof there. And that created some criticism because people were saying, well, you know, he wasn't really being uh, rigorous. On the other hand, he wrote the paper in such um, uh, thinking of a wide audience that also attracted a lot of people to the field. All right, so there is a, there is a trade off there as to how much detail you give and how much uh, a wide audience you want to attract. And I think he made the uh, uh, a conscientious decision of trying to uh, attract uh, a wide audience. All right, so um, so here's uh, let me tell you a little bit about Shannon. Um, a, here's a picture from Life magazine, 1950. Um, so he became instantly famous after this paper. So he was one of the icons of the post-war era. Uh, and back then, research was very much in vogue. It's not like now. Um, uh, so the war, the, world, the Second World War, had just been won largely thanks to uh, scientific research. So you know it had made great impetus in physics, in cryptography, in st statistical signal processing, and so on. So anyway, uh, just going very fast, this is the differential analyzer uh, at MIT. This was like the most advanced computing uh, machine at the time. And now we're talking about, this is from like late, thir late 30s. So after his, uh, after his undergraduate, uh, Shannon then uh, joined MIT as a research assistant and uh, was programming this machine. This machine was able to solve six order differential equations. And, um, you know, it uses an old system, the Lord Kelvin's uh, method of integration with wheels and balls. And, um, you know, he noticed that, uh, of course, the machine, as you see, is an analog, analog machine, but also it had a digital part because it was controlled by a series of relays. So he had this brilliant idea that um, he would apply Bull's, Bull's algebra to the design of these relay circuits. So really, this, this thesis is a master's thesis and uh, this is really the beginning of computer engineering, in a way. You know, the idea of, uh, of uh, systematizing the design of log logic circuits. Um, so 
that master thesis actually made him quite famous. He got uh, some important awards and so on. He went on to um, try to mimic what he had done here in, in, in the sense of using algebra applied to a specific problem. He tried to do that with genetics and wrote a PhD thesis on, on, on an algebra for genetics, but he never bothered publishing it. And then, uh, and then he joined the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton for just a few months. And then after that, he joined Bell Labs. Uh, so he was there um, in New York, in the New York location in the 1940s. And then by the time the 48 paper uh, had appeared, he had already moved to uh, Moray Hill. Uh, which at that time was the largest industrial laboratory in the world. All right, so this is still exists pretty much. And this is, this is uh, Nokia Bell Labs, the, the headquarters, I think, are there. So if you want to know more about Shannon, uh, there is now a, a book, uh, A Mind at Play, that appeared um, for uh, his centenary, which happened two years ago, 2016. And there's also a movie that um, I was involved with, um, <coughs> which is called The Beat Player. And uh, we're now looking for distribution of this movie, maybe Netflix, maybe who knows what. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, what was the technology like um, at the time of 1948. So in the... Um, in the early uh, 19th century, there was the, uh, the Morse telegraph. Of course, the telegraph had been really um, taken off here in France uh, by the time of Napoleon. But this was an optical telegraph uh, that really did not do any, um, any compression of information. But the Morse, uh, the Morse code, of course, is very relevant to information theory because it has this idea of assigning short descriptions to frequent letters and vice versa. So this, was, this is something that is very important in information theory. Then it came, came the, uh, the, uh, the wireless telegraph, Marconi, uh, the telephone, um, AM radio, which, which was the, the killer application for uh, vacuum tubes, uh, the amplifiers, television, FM radio. And this is also very important in the development of information theory because FM, all the beginning they thought, oh, you know, maybe if in, instead of modulating the amplitude, because uh, if we use, say, amplitude modulation, then the, mes the, the bandwidth of the transmitted signal is twice the bandwidth of the message. So then, you know, at, at that time there was already quite a bit of incentive to, to use as little bandwidth as possible. So then they thought, well, maybe if we just change the frequency just a little bit as a function of the message, then we can make that bandwidth as small as we want. Well, it turned out that it was just the opposite. The bandwidth exploded with FM re relative to AM, but it gave you some advantages. And, you know, it sounds better. It has better noise, noise immunity. And, um, and that, that's also a key ingredient in Shannon's thinking, because there you already have this notion of trading bandwidth for signal-to-noise ratio. So there are, there are benefits to wasting bandwidth. That FM gave you one, spread spectrum in the 1940s gave you even more. Okay? By using much more bandwidth in the message, then you can even have uh, signals that interfere with each other coexisting simultaneously in time and frequency. And then PCM was also, actually was invented here. It was, I think the, the first patent was in France. And that's the, that's the technology used in the compact disc. So you just sample at the Nyquist rate, and then you represent each sample with, um, with a binary word. What is PCM? Pulse code modulation. Yeah. Um, perhaps in, Fran in French you may know it by MIC, I don't know, Modulation Impulse codifi codifi I don't know, because in Spanish they call it MIC and maybe 
because they like to copy the French, so maybe I thought maybe in France it's called MIC. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so that's the technology of the CD. <coughs> that's exactly what the CD does. And, um, and uh, that again, you know, you, s you, you have the ingredient there, then you have an analog signal, and then you, trans you uh, transform it to digital. And uh, Shannon was very interested in actually um, finding out whether from the viewpoint of being efficient that made sense or it was just uh, a waste. And, uh, and as you saw, as you saw here, uh, you see in the first sentence of his paper he talks about PCM. PPM is uh, pulse position modulation. <coughs> okay, so so as I, was saying, as I was saying, this is just one of the few cases in science where a whole discipline comes out of the blue. And the greatest strength of this paper is how easy it is uh, to read. All right, so uh, let me give you a little bit of a very simple um, introduction to kind of like classifying these systems of storage and transmission. So we're going to talk about both the medium and the message. So depending on whether the medium, you know, depending on what the medium is, then you're going to be talking about transmission or storage. So transmission, you can think of anything that can transmit electromagnetic uh, radiation, telephone wires, optical, satellite broadcasting, microwave li links, you name it. Storage, typically now we use uh, semiconductor storage for volatile flash, uh, uh, flash memories, optical for uh, the CD, the Blu-ray, and magnetic, of course, which is also used in, um, in information technology. If we look at the message, then we have uh, analog messages like sound, images, video, sensor measurements. But we also have a lot of uh, applications where the messages are digital, like text or software, data, files, and so on. So, um, so going uh, going back to the um, going back to the idea here is that a fundamental notion here, which Shannon uh, noticed very uh, very early on, is that if you have a digital message you can shoot for reproduction of that message losslessly, so a, an exact copy. But if the message is analog, uh, that's impossible because the message itself, every real number is going to have an infinite amount of information, so there is no way that you can reproduce it uh, exactly. So you have to accept the fact that if you have analog messages, you're going to be reproducing those only approximately. Now, we also have the same kind of uh, classification as far as the medium is concerned. So you have an inherently analog medium like radio or wires or vinyl in the case of uh, LPs. Uh, or we may have digital media like computer memory, like the CD, the internet and so on. Now you may say, well, that's really a simplification, right? Because at the end of the day, all these things work with like uh, computer memories or the internet, they work with electricity, so at the end there is some analog uh, waveforms and so on that are really the ones that carry information. And the CD is the same, even though we think of it as, as really zeros and ones uh, inscribed on, um, on this medium, really what you see is also some kind of, uh, of analog uh, uh, waveforms there, if you actually look at it at a fine grain. And you could say also that in analog, you know, at the end of the day, things are quantum and perhaps, uh, you know, they are also digital there. So it depends on, on how fine um, you want to, to get into the modeling. So anyway, um, this, is, uh, this is a picture from Shannon's paper. And this is, this is the coat of arms of, uh, of communication theory. And basically, um, here, uh, I just reproduce his, his uh, figure, but basically we have three blocks, the transmitter, the receiver, and then in the middle we have uh, what Shannon called the channel. So the, uh, the purpose of the transmitter is to adapt the message 
to the channel and the purpose of the receiver is to adapt the receive signal that comes out of the channel and recover the transmitted message in the case of a digital message or an approximation to the message in the case of an analog message. All right, so this is a more modern, a more simple uh, representation of the same thing. All right, so the key problems here are are really two problems, okay? So even though it looks like um, we're going to deal with a transla translation of, uh, of sources into channel signals, there are really two problems. And the problems are transmission and compression. And, uh, and the thing that, uh, that really unites the, 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 the leading um, idea here, the unifying idea, is the idea of redundancy. So as far as compression, what we want to do is eliminate redundancy, eliminate uh, what is not necessary. So things that you can, you can reconstruct at the receiver. So don't spend time, waste, don't waste time uh, sending redundant information, just send whatever is needed. And in transmission is dual, it's the other way. So transmission you want to protect against error, so you actually need to add redundancy to your data so that when some of this data is damaged, you can still reconstruct it because the data has this uh, built-in redundancy, which is fully known to the receiver. Okay, so then Shannon says, well, really, out of th this diagram, what I would recommend is that you study three special cases. And once you study these three special cases, then uh, pretty much you'll know how to solve the most general case. So what are the three special cases? First uh, special case is when you don't have a channel, or better uh, say, you have a perfect channel, or what you have at the output of the encoder is what you have at the input of the decoder. If you have a uh, di digital uh, a message, like a text, then you will be interested in um, reproducing that text perfectly. So the idea here is not only to uh, write this text in binary, but use as few bits as possible. Okay, so that's one uh, problem where the main, uh, the main goal here is to remove redundancy. Now, what if we do the same thing, again, with a perfect channel, but with audio? Then, then the game changes from before, because now, as I said, is really approximate reproduction. And, um, and then this is going to be um, much more complicated in the sense that the main goal here is going to be to fool the human ear or, to, or the human eye. So we have to do a reproduction that is going to sound very much like the original, but using as few bits as possible. So how can we do that? And then finally, uh, this one looks like uh, the original one, but uh, an important uh, special case, and the, that the input of the encoder here is pure, uh, pure bits. So these are just independent uh, equiprobable bits. They have no redundancy whatsoever, and then you want to reproduce that sequence. Not perfectly, because whenever you have a channel, whenever you have, or most of the time, I, I shouldn't say whenever, but most of the time you have a random box here, it's going to be impossible to reproduce that thing exactly with probability one. So you have to allow errors. And that was actually one of the good ideas of Shannon, that even in the case when, when you just have digital information, because you have a channel, you won't be able to reproduce that digital information perfectly. You'll have to allow errors. All right, so <coughs> the first case is the, the case of uh, lossless compression, and that technology is used all the time. For example, when you zip a file, when, um, when you send it through a modem or compact disk and so on, that uses lossless compression. Um, the next one, uh, lossy compression, mm, you know, like, uh, like uh, MPEG or JPEG and so on. 
And then finally, the, the idea of data transmission, where uh, you are going to protect your data with error correcting codes. All right, so here uh, you want to remove redundancy in these two cases, and in this case, you want to add redundancy to combat the, the channel noise. All right, so now that we've made all those classifications, now we can go back to the uh, technologies that we saw before. And now you see these are, these, these are all technologies that have an analog message in a digital medium. So then the medium here is in inherently digital. And, um, and we just want to convert these sounds and images and, uh, and pictures into bits. Now in this case, it's the other way. So we have uh, digital messages like the fax, and then uh, we want to send them through an analog medium, for example, the copper wire, or here we want to have digital transmission of information with satellites. Uh, sometimes we also have digital messages and digital mediums. So for example, um, here's, here's one where we are storing uh, stuff in a, in, a, in a purely digital medium. Um, then of course the problem there is how, how do you do the compression of these uh, digital messages. And sometimes even though you have digital to digital you are familiar with, uh, with this menu because sometimes um, you may want to have some degradation in quality for the sake of reducing the size, even if you have a digital file. Okay? So you may have a, a picture, a digital picture, but you are willing to degrade it uh, for the sake of reducing its size. So that would be a problem of lossy compression. All right, and then you have, you know, the the plain old uh, systems like the, the telephone system, FM, TV, uh, analog TV, uh, the cassette and so on. So those are uh, analog messages and analog medium. Okay, but analog messages and analog medium, it, this looks like uh, old, uh, old technology. But in fact, of course, nowadays we also need to do things like that, right? We have our phones, um, our phones, in fact, are converting analog information into analog in an analog medium because it's an electromagnetic waves. Uh, digital, um, I mean, this is television, but now the television, almost everywhere now, is actually digital. So you convert the uh, the the message that is analog to digital form, and then you use those bits to then uh, feed a modulator to, uh, to, um, to send through an analog channel. So this is uh, satellite radio and the, the telephone, the telephone that we use uh, nowadays is rarely analog. Most of the time it's using PCM and most of the time now it's using the internet to carry uh, those bits. Okay, so the paradigm there in the last slide is then what we do is first we compress the signal, we go from analog to digital, then we use a transmitter that goes from digital to analog, that goes through a, an analog medium, and then we undo that. So the receiver goes from analog to digital and the decompressor goes from digital to analog. Now, this is, um, this is a paradigm which is the paradigm that is used now most of the time in practice. And it has some advantages. For example, the person who designs this box and this box doesn't really have to talk to the person who designs this box and this box. So you just, mm, you know, they just need to agree on a data rate, but the currency the, they exchange <coughs> are bits. So you can have an expert here who knows a lot about how to compress sources and you can have an, ec an expert here who knows a lot about how to combat the noise in this channel, but you can divvy up the work between these two. And this actually comes from Shannon. This idea of, um, of uh, breaking the task 
of modulating an analog signal into an analog signal by going first to digital, this goes to Shannon, who showed that, in fact, if you do this, you actually, under some conditions, under some caveat, if you do this, you don't lose efficiency. So by separating it into analog to digital, digital to analog, you can do it in a way that is as efficient as if you would say, no, I'm going to allow here the most general type of box, some box that goes from analog to analog. Okay, so this is what is called the separation principle. The fact that uh, you can go to digital. All right, so those are the three special cases. And, uh, and as, uh, as we saw uh, in the last diagram, once you have solved those three special cases in isolation, then you can put them together. So you can send texts through channels by hooking up a lossless compression to a data transmission system. OK, so that's what we saw before. And uh, so what is information theory? Well, information theory is the analysis of the fundamental limits of both compression and transmission. OK, so uh, what, are, what do I mean by fundamental limits? Well, what I mean is that in the case of lossless compression, I'm going to make a mathematical problem out of this by saying, well, what I want to do is eliminate the maximum amount of redundancy. In other words, I want to find what is the minimal number of bits that is required for perfect reconstruction. In the case of lossy compression, I also want to remove redundancy, but now I'm going to say, well, now I'm going to require a given fidelity. For example, a given uh, signal-to-noise ratio. What is the minimum number of bits I, can, uh, I need in order to do that? And finally, for data transmission, I'm going to say, well, I'm, go I, I'm going to have to add redundancy. How many bits do I need to, uh, to include in addition to the raw data so that I can uh, decode the information reliably? So notice that in, every, um, in, in each of these cases, in fact, the, uh, the figure of merit is a rate bits per second or bits per character. And in, in, uh, in the compression case, I want to minimize that. In the data transmission case, I want to maximize that. OK, so um, you know, the idea of, um, the idea of uh, uh, mathematizing a technology problem uh, was not new at the, at, the, uh, at the time of Shannon, of course. And in the particular case of communication, there were already uh, some successes, especially at the time of World War II, in estimation. So in the estimation of signals, in order to uh, eliminate, uh, or not eliminate, but reduce the effect of noise, both Wiener and uh, Kolmogorov uh, had come up with optimal uh, filters just based on second order uh, statistics. So there is a big difference between their work and Shannon's work in the sense that they were also be able to find the fundamental limits, but they found the fundamental limits of these problems of estimation by actually constructing the optimal filter, the optimal solution. Okay, so we find what the optimal solution is, and then you analyze what the optimal solution achieves, and that gives you the fundamental limit. Okay, Shannon did not have that luxury because Shannon was facing a much tougher problem. So the problem of designing an encoder or a decoder or a compressor is actually uh, much, much more difficult than the problems that, uh, that were being dealt at the time. So difficult that we still don't know what the op optimal solution is. Even if I tell you what the channel is perfectly, what the source is perfectly, you, you can rarely find what the optimal solution is. So then what Shannon did 
in order to uh, find those fundamental limits is he was able to find what the fundamental limits were without actually telling you how to do it. So how can that be? Well, he used, he invented really the probabilistic method. So the idea is that he said, well, I'm going to analyze not a specific system, but I'm going to analyze an ensemble of systems. So I'm going to put uh, a probability distribution on the set of all possible codes, and I'm going to show that on average the performance is going to be, say, below some threshold. For example, the error probability on average is going to be below a certain threshold. So if on average is going to be below that particular threshold, that means that at least there is one system that whose error probability is below that threshold. So that's an existence proof. Okay? And uh, similar ideas were, uh, uh, were being developed at the same time by Erdos in combinatorics. But um, what Erdos, uh, Erdos was a little bit lagging uh, with respect to Shannon because his first uh, uses of the probabilistic methods, you can really see them just as counting and, um, and not so much being as probabilistic tools. So it was really Shannon who came up with this method and it's, it's still the best way to prove uh, theorems in information theory to use the probabilistic method, which we call random coding. Okay, so here we have um, we have three um, three uh, key uh, aspects here, fundamental limits. First, we have this is the performance of the best encoder and decoder. Second, this is technology independent because Shannon poses the problem of designing these encoders and decoders, but without any type of uh, complexity constraints. Okay, so what that means is that, in fact, information theory never really becomes obsolete. On the contrary, the more technology advances, the more relevant it becomes, because that it means that you can come closer and closer to the fundamental limits. And also the, the nice feature is that it's really mathematics-driven design, unlike what was happening before 1948, where Everybody was like, okay, I, had, I have a particular expertise in frequency modulation, so I'm going to be very good at designing a circuit for demodulating uh, frequency modulation, or someone else maybe is working on, uh, on a coaxial cable, or someone is working on optical communications, and they have their own domain of expertise. So Shannon says, no, 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 stop that. There's only one problem here. Okay, so if you understand that problem, you don't need to specialize, you don't need to call yourself an optical communication person, you don't need to call yourself a microwave person, the, the principles are going to be the same. Okay. And that, of course, did not happen on a vacuum. Uh, so, uh, you know, if I had to choose the three most important uh, influences, in, uh, in modern communication theory, I would, uh, I would select these three. Um, so, uh, especially, let me uh, tell you a little bit about Markov. Uh, the Markov chain uh, played a very important role in Shannon's thinking, and it was only, um, was only about 30 years old. The Markov chain uh, I was really uh, started in uh, 1913, that's the first paper that Markov uh, gave, where he was doing an analysis of uh, Eugene Onegin, uh, Pushkin's um, poem, and he was looking at uh, what was the probability that a consonant was following a vowel and so on, um, and found that, you know, if you were to, to use a Markov assumption, that that would be good. So Shannon, uh, of course, recognize that if you want to remove redundancy from, uh, from a text, from natural language, mo the Morse code does it only at a very simple level in the sense that, okay, it's going to uh, assign a short code for E and a long code for Z because one letter is more probable than the other. But language has redundancy not only because of that unequal probability of letters, but because 
letters have memory, right? So if there is a Q, then most likely the next letter is going to be a U, and you can capitalize on that. So then he said, well, maybe I can, I can, uh, I can uh, simplify, and I can take a very, toy, very simple toy model of language and model it as a Markov chain. And that was really one of his great strokes of genius, that he said, well, really, language is too, too complex. Let me just do a very coarse assumption, assu assume that it's a Markov chain. Markov chain of maybe a generalized order is not that it only depends on the last letter, it may depend on the last five letters and so on, but uh, let's see what happens. And of course, linguists like Noam Chomsky immediately came up, came after that and says, what are you talking about? That's terrible. No, but you cannot really model uh, language with a mark of chain, even if the order is unlimited. Yes, it's a, it's a bad assumption, but it's a good assumption in the sense that you get a lot of mileage when you're an engineer and you have that thinking. And when you prove theorems also, we do, I mean, you can prove theorems well beyond the assumption of mark of chains. For example, you can as assume completely general stationary ergodic processes, but the proofs, even in that general case, work by doing Markov approximations to those, uh, to those uh, uh, sources. All right, so, um, so here's the, uh, the idea. The, the idea of Shannon really was revolutionary at the time but when, when we now see it in with our optics of nowadays, we say, well, this is obvious. Why wouldn't people think of doing that? So he, he modeled the source as a random process. He modeled the noise as a random process. So this was kind of like already people recognized. The probability was already being part of the toolbox of the communication engineer at, uh, in 1948. That was well known. People wanted you know, had done all sorts of analysis of analog mod modulation systems. But actually modulate, I mean, um, uh, mo modeling the source as a random process, as a Markov chain, for example, in the case of text, that was more revolutionary. And the other thing that Shannon said is, okay, I'm only going to worry about average behavior. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I'm going to trust the asymptotic. So it means that Shannon's theory was really an asymptotic theory in the sense that is assuming that you're using this channel for a relatively long time or that you have sources of information that are really long. All right, so let me, uh, let me illustrate this with a, with a quote by a Frenchman, Jean-Luc Godard, who is a famous uh, filmmaker, says, all you need for a movie Not is a... French, Swiss. Oh, it's Swiss, okay. Yeah. Okay, Nobody nobody's perfect. Yeah, exactly. um, so he, sa he said, uh, all you need for a movie is a, uh, is a gun and a girl. All right, so what does have to do with information theory? So all you need for information theory is a log and a limb, okay? A logarithm and a limit. So this is what you always find when you take the when you study the subject and so on. Logarithms are everywhere. Why, where do the logarithms come from? Well, in the most uh, simple, uh, in the most simple setting, you can imagine that if I have to, say, label the people in this room uh, in bits, then what I need is the log logarithm base two of the number of people in the room, okay? So that's, that's where really logarithms come from. Um, and then the limit comes from the fact that, as I say, we are dealing with asymptotics. Asymptotics in how long you use the channel or how long is your text. And then another thing that we are, uh, we are very, very, uh, and this is really the, the key to the success of information theory, is the obsession with the toy model in the sense that you know, if you try to really uh, look at real, real sources, like images, or real channels, like the channel for the smartphone and so on, these are very, very complicated. 
very, very complicated objects. So what we do is we say, you know, we work with a toy model and uh, any similarities with real sources and channels are purely coincidental. But by working with extremely simple models, we can learn a lot. Okay? You learn a lot, you learn how to code for these sources and channels that are, uh, that are simple, but then the proof, is, the proof is in the actual technology, that in fact, even though we're using these very simple models, they are extremely powerful. Okay? So here's an experiment you can do, uh, I theory. So you can ask your friends, how come the more bars you have, the faster is your download? Okay? So if you ask this question to uh, your computer science friend, they'll say, well, you have, uh, you have more, more bandwidth. Well, but wait a second. No, you don't have more bandwidth. You, s you have the same bandwidth. The bandwidth of the signals is already assigned. And you're not changing the bandwidth when you are closer to the base station. Okay? So what happens there is that y your signals are affected by less noise. And therefore, the system is able to discriminate more signals in the same amount of time. And therefore, you can send more bits per second. Okay, so <coughs> let's, let's mathematize that and uh, there's a Shannon's famous formula and this gives you the maximum number of bits per second, the capacity. That's the bandwidth of the channel, that's the power and this is the noise level. So you see that bandwidth appears both here and here. So if, if you fix this ratio and you let bandwidth go to infinity, the capacity does not go to infinity. Okay? It, the capacity with infinite bandwidth is just going to be essentially um, the signal-to-noise ratio there. Okay? And, uh, and vice versa, if you have only one hertz of bandwidth, you can send one gigabit of information, one gigabit per second of information through one hertz, no problem. You just need to have huge signal to noise ratio. Okay, so there is a there is a trade-off between these things. Now this formula is very nice, you can put it in t-shirts and so on, but um, but it's very limited in scope in the sense that it's for a very simple toy model, which is just the um, the ideal uh, Gaussian channel, linear channel with, uh, with an ideal uh, transfer function, square transfer function. All right, so that, that's a formula that comes from uh, Shannon's 1948 paper. All right, so, um, so information theory, by and large, is based on the study of this information measure. So there are three uh, key information measures, entropy, mutual information, and relative entropy. In fact, Shannon only used the first two, and he didn't even uh, call it mutual information, the second one, uh, and he didn't develop even a, a symbol for it, but it plays a very important role. So entropy is a measure <coughs> of, you, you have a discrete uh, probability mass function, so it's a measure of how spread that probability mass function is. So you take, the, you take the probability, the reciprocal, you take the logarithm, so that's a measure of the surprise of that particular outcome, and then you just take the average. So that's, as I say, measure of how spread out a distribution is. Mutual information is a measure and this, of course, these this measures are all in bits or in other information units, depending on what uh, base you use for the logarithm. So it's just like in physics, you, you have units in these information measures. So mutual information is uh, a way to measure how dependent two random variables are. Okay, They don't have to be real valued, they can be abstract valued, these random variables. And then what is this? This is the relative entropy. So this is the relative entropy between the joint distribution and the product of the two marginals. So this is zero only, this relative entropy here is zero 
if and only if p is equal to q. And, um, and it's measuring, as I say, the distinctness between these two distributions. So in this formula, this uh, y, this expectation is with respect to y, y has the distribution of q. All right, so this was, um, this was a measure that was introduced uh, by Kulbach and Leidler right after Shannon came up uh, with the introduction of entropy and mutual information in 1948. And they were really driven by their desire to uh, to extend this to not just discrete random variables, but uh, arbitrary random variables. So this has turned out to be an extremely useful um, information measure that is used uh, in many, many different uh, subjects. And that's why it has so many names. We call it in so many different ways. Uh, cool black library discrimination and uh, information divergence and many, many different names. All right, so then uh, the role of information theory, you could, you could view the role as being a bridge because it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the bridge that uh, goes from the questions, and the questions are engineering questions, like the ones I posed before. Minimal number of bits per second that I need to do blah, blah, blah. That's a question that the engineer would be interested in asking. And then the, the, um, the answer comes in terms of... Uh, of an information measure. So typically, for example, um, you will say, well, the, the, um, the minimal uh, information content in a source so that you can reproduce this source perfectly at the receiver is the entropy. Right? So that's a very important uh, theorem by Shannon even though he proved it only in special cases, but we can prove it in very high generality nowadays. When you, uh, when you ask the question, what is the maximal number of bits per second I can send through the channel, then it turns out that the answer is given by the maximal mutual information that you can establish between the input and the output of the channel by optimizing over all possible inputs. Okay, and then relative entropy um, is also the answer to other problems that you can pose, maybe problems that do not have to uh, deal with redundancy, but problems like, for example, in, uh, in detection and estimation, then this turns out to be uh, a key measure. Or in large deviations, of course, relative entropy also plays a very important role. All right, so here I... I put here the emphasis on the theorems rather than the definitions because in the kind of like in the uh, layman's imagination, in the layman's uh, um, view uh, of Shannon, you know, he's always, he's always um, credited with the introduction of entropy or the use of a concept from uh, statistical physics to communications problems. And that is really not the main advance. The main advance is to be able to say that the entropy or the mutual information is actually the answer to a technology problem. Okay, so let me give you uh, a very brief um, overview of uh, some of the technology landmarks um, in, um, in the development of this field. Because you know, Shannon tells you, as I said before, it tells you what is the fundamental limit, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. It doesn't tell you how to achieve it, okay? So then, since he poses the question without any, <coughs> without any uh, constraint on complexity, you could even, you could even uh, challenge it and say, well, if there is no constraint on complexity, it may be that is a science fiction because you may need such an improbable complexity to actually c come close to these limits that maybe, you know, uh, if an engineer is designing a, a Ferrari, uh, the speed of light is really not very uh, relevant, right? If you're designing. But if you are in Qualcomm and you're designing a modem, a wireless modem, and so on, you'd better know information theory. And because indeed you can achieve very close to, uh, 
to the Shannon limit with current technology. So let me, let me spend just a couple of, uh, of minutes telling you the main highlights. So uh, Shannon already in 1948 in his paper uh, uh, makes reference to a code invented by um, a person in his group in Bell Labs, Hamming, the Hamming code, and that's a beautiful uh, <coughs> geometric object. It can, uh, so in its simplest incarnation, uh, you want to send four bits of information, but you're allowed to add three uh, redundant bits, okay? And if you do it in a clever way, in the Hamming way, you can do it so that if there is one error, if one of those uh, se seven bits is received in error, then you can correct it, no matter where that error occurs, okay? If there is more than one error, then maybe you won't be able to correct it. Maybe you will introduce even more errors than you started with, okay? All right, so that's, uh, that's really a phenomenally beautiful object. And, you know, uh, people, when they try to come up with codes that would come close to the Shannon limit, tried for a long time to actually um, continue along that path, what we call algebraic coding theory, of trying to design beautiful mathematical objects, geometric objects, where all these code words fill the space in a very regular way. Well, turn out, that turned out to be a wrong turn. People should not have tried to do that because this is nice when you want to do a design for worst case. So you say, okay, I know for a fact that I am only going to get one error. But Shannon was not playing that game in 1948. Shannon said, well, uh, you know, I know that my channel is going to introduce 10% of errors. Sometimes it will introduce exactly 10%. Sometimes it may introduce 7%. Sometimes it may introduce 15%. So it's more of a statistical model, not a worst case. Um, uh, so it's an average type of model, not a worst case type of model. All right, so then... Um, then Elias, in the 1950s, came up with this idea of using convolutional codes, uh, where really the, uh, the name comes from convolution on, uh, on a linear system, the fact that you have a, a long stream or even an infinite stream of bits, and then at the output you have also an infinite stream of bits. Simple encoding, but the decoding of those codes Actually, it took uh, 20 years until someone came up with an optimal decoding that was also computationally, um, computationally feasible. So it turned out that dynamic programming was the answer, and Viter rediscovered that in 1967. All right, so then um, some other codes, algebraic geometry codes, Rich Solomon. These are the codes used in the compact disk, for example. Then in the early 60s, um, Gallagher in his PhD thesis came up with this idea of, um, you know, Shannon in 1948, remember that he said, well, I don't know how to design codes. The only code I know is this Hamming code, but this is only block length seven. Now, if I want to go to the asymptotic regime and have long uh, codes, I really have no clue how to do that. So, as I said, he used this idea of random coding, evaluate the performance on average, and then, you know, then for sure there must be someone, some code that, uh, that achieves good performance. So then Gallagher said, okay, let me um, kind of borrow a key idea from there, and is that, you know, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be analyzing not a particular code, but really an ensemble of codes, except that he didn't pick all possible codes, but he restricted his, uh, his choice of codes to a very manageable class, which I'm not going to get into in detail. Uh, and um, he quickly forgot about these codes. And in fact, the world forgot about these codes. Uh, he even wrote a, a book for, uh, six years later, and he doesn't even mention these codes in that book. So that was kind of like forgotten. And then you see there is a big gap uh, before the next, um, before the next uh, highlight. And what was happening here is that people were actually losing faith, 
faith in Shannon. Because, you know, it was already 50, 45 years later, and nobody had really come up with codes that could come close to what Shannon had, had promised. So then people started saying, well, maybe there are other measures. Maybe capacity is not the right measure. If you're an engineer, maybe you should be looking at other things, something called cutoff rate, some other stuff that people said maybe what happens with capacity is that if you really want to come very close to capacity, you know, you have to have uh, an incredibly complicated machine. All right. Now, 1993. In France, there is the big discovery, the turbo codes. And this is, um, this was uh, in e ENST in Bretagne. And nobody knew these people. Nobody knew them. Uh, and uh, the paper was just simulation. They were combining some of the stuff that Elias had done here, some convolutional codes, also with a, with a random ingredient just like Gallagher had here in these low-density parity check codes, a random interleaver, and they were showing amazing performance, very close to the Shannon limit. So the reaction was that nobody believed them. Mm. All right? Nobody believed that these uh, simulations could be right. So what did they do? Well, they tried to reproduce them, and lo and behold, people were saying, yes, this works. These guys... Indeed, the numbers they have, these numbers are true. So that was the revolution. That was the revolution. And then some people also uh, then kind of rediscovered this idea of Gallagher that had laid dormant. And, um, and that's really uh, the beginning of modern coding theory, the fact that now we can have technology. In our phones, we have this technology. Now, and, oh, and the key was that they went back to 1948. And in 1948, Shannon said, well, you know, I don't know how to design the best code, but let me, let me do it on average. And then you say, well, wait a second. If, uh, if you can do that, and in fact, Shannon showed that not only there is a, a code that is going to be almost optimal, but in fact, if you choose a code at random, with very high probability is going to be an excellent code. So then you're saying, why, why are we worrying about this? If we select a code at random and it's good, why do we need to spend any effort into this? Well, yes, it's going to be good, but if you pick a code at random, it will have no structure, so we, you won't be able to decode it. Because you cannot, you cannot just list all the code words of a code and then, uh, and then just go one by one testing which is the, the most likely one. Why not? Well, because you may have two to the uh, 100,000 code words, two to the one million code words. So brute force is not an option. So then uh, what uh, Beru and Glavier uh, noticed is that using their structure, in fact, it was easy to come up with a suboptimal decoder, but it was a suboptimal decoder that did a very good job. So in other words, it was, like, it was essentially like a crossword puzzle that you're trying to, you know, first you try to decode the horizontal, then you go to back to the vertical, then you go back to horizontal, and so on. So they had two codes, two convolutional codes, and by, you know, first going to one code, decoding one, and then going to the other, and so on. And the key idea in, in their principle is that you don't make hard decisions in the sense that you don't say at each point, you don't say, oh, that, that I'm sure it's a zero. That, I'm not sure, but I would bet it's a one. No, what you do is you say, well, I think that's a zero with a certain probability. So you are always keeping track of the probabilities of what you think the original data was. So you exchange soft information, and that's a key idea too. So random coding, the idea of Shannon, then got revived, but also the idea of not, not insisting on optimal decoding, uh, allowing suboptimal decoding, belief propagation, algorithms like that, iterative algorithms that can be shown to be extremely powerful. 
irregular LDPC, we have Cyril Miasson here, who is one of the expert in this, you can, you can assign, uh, you can design these LDPCs to have um, excellent performance and uh, get as close as you want to the Shannon limit with very, uh, very good complexity. And finally, the, the most important um, uh, milestone in this race was the polar codes. Those are also capacity achieving codes. Uh, but you can actually show that they are capacity achieving with a pretty uh, elegant uh, mathematical proof. And now, in fact, they are being pushed for some applications, even though originally this um, looked like more of, a, of a, a class of codes with academic interest, because maybe the trade-offs of uh, delay performance may not have been the best. Now they are also attracting a lot of attention for for wireless communications and so on. All right, so now um, let me tell you a little bit about the milestones in lossless data compression. So Shannon came up with a code, uh, uh, the Shannon code in 1948, which is very interesting, but is not used uh, in practice. Then Huffman uh, came up with um, with a code, which is a prefix code, and has the minimal average um, uh, length. But the problem is that uh, this only um, works well with sources that, that do not have memory. So if you want to capitalize on the memory of the source, not only on the fact that the letters are not equiprobable, then this does not scale. So the Huffman code then is not what you want to do. For that purpose, you, you can use this arithmetic coding of uh, reasoning, or you can use, and this is what you have in every computer, uh, the Lempel-Sieff uh, code. And the Lempel-Sieff code, uh, there are actually several Lempel-Sieff codes, but as I always say, this is the most successful machine learning algorithm there is to date. Okay, why machine learning? Well, because it really does that. It really it's a code that you can encode just in, uh, in, ten, uh, in 10 instructions. And it's able to learn the statistics of the source. You don't have to tune this algorithm to the specific source that, that you are encoding. Okay? So you can feed it a text in French, you can feed it a, ten a text in Icelandic. If it's a long enough text, if you can learn because the text is long enough, then it turns out that asymptotically you don't pay a penalty in the rate because of the fact that you didn't know the source. So th you're going to have, you're, you're going to pay a penalty non-asymptotically because up until the point where you have learned that source very well, you're not going to be efficient. So the proof that lempel sieff actually is an optimal algorithm in the sense that it achieves the Shannon limit. That's one of the crown jewels of information theory. The fact that we can prove that a, a simple algorithm, extremely efficient, linear time, can get you to the Shannon limit and essentially works for every source, stationary or ergodic. That's really one of the, of the big highlights. So you can do better than that. What do you mean better than optimal? Well, on the short run. So on the short run, you know, things can, you can learn things faster than Lempel-Sieff by, uh, by other methods, but those methods are much more um, costly to implement and the software complexity is higher. So in most applications, uh, people use Lempel-Sieff. Okay. Now, there are sources for which we really don't know whether the technology is already mature to the same point as, the, as, as this or not. For example, digital images. If you want lossless uh, compression of digital images, then we don't really know how, how well, how good the, the current solutions are. Because we know how to exploit redundancy well when we have Markov structures. When we go to the world of real uh, images, then we don't, we don't really understand what is the actual ensemble of images that we, we really are interested in. So of course it's a tiny, tiny, tiny 
a fraction of all possible images, but we still don't understand it. And this is, this is uh, in the domain of lossless compression. When we go to the domain of lossy compression, then we have to worry about not only the source, but only also we need to worry about the eye and the ear, because we, we need to understand how they work so that we can fool them. All right? And that's, that adds yet another layer of uh, complexity. So we saw, the, uh, we saw the PCM in 1938. Also, uh, at the same time, there was this vocoder they showed in the Universal Exposition in, uh, in New York. So this was a system where they could, they could program a machine to talk. So you, there was an operator that would type a text, and then this machine then would read this text. And of course, then you also have the, uh, the dual operation of listening to a sound and then converting into bits. And now, of course, in our phones, we have much more sophisticated algorithms to do that, to convert these voices, in this, uh, this audio, into bits. All right, so, you know, then the latest things would be JPEG, MPEG, and so on. Now, interestingly, I was saying before that if you are an engineer at, uh, at Nokia or Qualcomm designing, uh, designing uh, cellular phones to transmit information through uh, these complicated channels, you really need to know information theory. However, here, people who design this uh, JPEG, MPEG, and so on, they did not necessarily know a lot of information theory. So this, uh, this area of lossy data compression, the gap between theory and practice is still quite a bit bigger than in the other two. Okay. So still, there is a lot of work to do here in terms of uh, understanding more about how the human uh, brain works and how to come up with algorithms that are able to do what we can do in lossless compression by learning about the source and adapting themselves uh, to the source. So how are we doing with time, Philippe? Uh, as long as you are alive. Uh, as long as I'm, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, so, you know, so information theory is more, s is more than just finding those fundamental limits. It's more just than, you know, coming up with technology that will will uh, meet those fundamental limits. There is a lot of technology that it actually uh, has, been, uh, has been spurred by information theory. So information theory also is used as a design driver. And Shannon, from the beginning, Shannon uh, already noticed that. So let me give you a glimpse at some of the problems that are of uh, contemporary interest, because sometimes when you tell people, you know, that, what do you work on information theory? Oh, are people start, uh, still working on that? I thought that had th been done in 1948 by Shannon. Yes, okay. We still have a few problems left. <laughs> um, so one of the problems is, is the non-asymptotic regime. And this is something that I've been doing the last uh, few years. But, um, you know, essentially the, uh, the question is, what is the finite block length capacity? So as I told you before, this uh, idea of Shannon is to use the channel for a long time. But if you say, well, the block length is only 1,000, uh, and that's typically what happens. So they'll tell the engineer, look, you cannot use block length more than 1,000 because there are problems of delay and so on. You have to do it with 1,000, 500, whatever. All right, so then uh, how re relevant is, is the Shannon limit to that? And it turns out that, um, you know, you don't have a clean answer. You don't have like a formula that gives you the capacity. So the capacity is just the limit as a function of block length when of block length goes to infinity. So here I'm plotting the best rate that you can achieve, the, the highest number of bits per, per channel use as a function of block length. The, the longer block length, the better. Why? Because you are less at the mercy of, of the channel noise. So in the short run, you may be subject to bad luck. In the long run, there is no such thing as bad luck or good luck. You know, you're going to converge with probability one. So there is, there is a gap to capacity that you have to take 
because of the finite block length. And uh, we don't know a formula for that as a function of block length, but we know good upper and lower bounds. And as you see here, this is for a specific channel, a very simple channel, but you can see that the gap in this case is, is quite tight. So for the purposes of the engineer, knowing uh, things like this um, is very important because, you know, if, if you are here, if you develop that technology that is here, is at that point, then by being more clever, you'll be able to gap, uh, you'll be able to bridge, bridge the gap, only half of the gap. Half of the, the other half is unbridgeable because, because of the finite block length uh, penalty. Yeah, so, um, you know, in these single user channels, when you only have one transmitter, one receiver, then, uh, oh, I don't know what I did here. Um, you know, there are problems of feedback. We don't really understand feedback very well in, the in connection with information theory. Shannon wrote a very important paper on that, where he showed that if you have a channel without memory, then feedback is not going to help you. You know, even if you know exactly and the transmitter what the receiver sees, you cannot uh, get better capacity. When you have uh, deletions and synchronization errors, that's also a long-standing open problem. A lot of the problems that are still open have to do with what's called multi-user channels, where we have um, more than one transmitter and one, one receiver. For example, you may have you may have um, crosstalk, so you may have uh, a transmitter, and this transmitter only wants to transmit to receiver A, and B only wants to transmit to B, but there is leakage of information from A to B and from B to A. So then you may want to find here what are the best rates that we can establish for these, these pairs. And this is still an open problem, even, even when you have very simple channel models there, that turns out to be an open problem. Okay, so broadcast channels, when you have one transmitter, several receivers, but you may want to send different information to every receiver, or every receiver may have different signal-to-noise ratios, that also is a very tough uh, problem. And, you know, I said at the beginning that, um, that if, you, if you know how to solve these three special cases, then you know how to solve the whole thing. But that's with one caveat. So when I showed you that diagram where you went from analog to digital, from digital to analog and so on, and I said Shannon showed that this is optimal, only showed it in the long run. So when you have systems that uh, have these uh, delay limitations, that's no longer optimal. And then there is something to be gained by doing joint compression and transmission of information. So rather than following this paradigm of first remove all redundancy from the source and then add redundancy tailored to the channel, there might be something to be gained by doing it in one shot. Another very tough problem is uh, how, to, uh, you know, how to do compression of uh, short sources, so short messages. So how, you know, how, uh, how to do this optimally? So here you have several issues that you need to worry about. One is that because you have short messages, it's hard to learn. Of course, you can learn from previous messages, and then you can develop if, if indeed these messages are put out by the same source. But then, uh, then second is that you cannot rely on asymptotic. So entropy is no longer here the name of the game because entropy is only an asymptotic answer to the question. So this is still, um, this is still uh, open, by and large open, although there has been progress um, nowadays. So as I was saying, lossy data compression, the gap here between theory and practice is larger than in the others. Constructive schemes, this is more like an art, you know, when they come up with tricks to fool the ear and the eye with JPEG, MPEG, and so on. 
And, uh, and when you go to the multi-user counterparts of these problems, say for example, you have, you have a, a left microphone, uh, a right microphone, and these, these are different sources, but of course they are correlated. So then instead of having a quantizer or an analog to digital quantizer for each of these microphones, assuming that this is a single source, that's wasteful because the dependence between both messages enables you to save bits, okay? How do you save bits? That's something that we know how to solve in very simple special cases, but still a lot of work remains to be done. And, uh, you know, another thing that is beautiful about this subject is that it has so many intersections with uh, all sorts of uh, disciplines. So, of course, engineering, it came from engineering, um, but mathematics, it has had, uh, it has had, it has had uh, an important, uh, an important um, role. Of course, not just in consuming mathematics to solve its problems, but in having something to say that is of interest to mathematicians. So, for example, in ergodic theory, Kolmogorov immediately um, realized that uh, what Shannon had done was very important in ergodic theorem. So, in ergodic theory, so there was the isomorphism problem where entropy is really key. Large deviations uh, in probability, relative entropy there is, uh, is the key. So, um, you know, typically the question there is how do you explain very improbable events? And these improbable events may have a lot of different explanations. So large deviations tells you, well, you only need to analyze among the, all these unlikely explanations, analyze the most likely among the unlikely explanations. And how do you define most... Um, most likely, well, it's defined in terms of relative entropy. So the relative entropy between what you are observing and what you would expect to be observing, that is, that is what matters. Functional analysis, uh, uncertainty principles, information theory has had uh, an important role. Convex analysis coming up with alternative proofs for a lot of the inequalities like Brun, Minkowski and so on. Measure concentration, uh, Talagrand um, has also used uh, quite a bit of uh, information theory in isoparametric uh, inequalities and so on. Combinatorics, uh, a lot of uh, good co combinatorics have come, up, uh, come out of information theory. For example, the notion of graph entropy. Uh, random matrices also is an area that uh, saw quite a bit of excitement uh, because it was very uh, relevant to uh, wireless communication systems. Um, for example, multi-antenna arrays, uh, CDMA communications and so on. Um, there was a lot of excitement about using uh, fairly recent random matrix uh, results. All right. Um, physics, I guess every time physics is becoming more and more uh, probabilistically oriented, the, the, the push from, from quantum physics also is very important, quantum information theory. So, uh, of course, quantum information theory developed with uh, some lack with respect to uh, classical information theory, but a lot of the results uh, that were proven f uh, in classical models now have counterparts in, uh, in quantum information theory. But of course there, the issue uh, I mentioned before as an open problem, the issue of finite block lengths of non-asymptotics is even more important than in the classical case. Because if in the classical case I, I was saying, you know, Sometimes you only have a thousand bits you can send in each of these packets. Well, in quantum, maybe five bits or maybe okay, five qubits or ten qubits or something like that. Okay? So at least for the, for the rest of uh, the lifetime of people like, um, like the speakers uh, today. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, computer science, um, 
you know, uh, Kolmogorov had this idea that you could define uh, complexity by not uh, introducing a probabilistic model. Like Shannon, you know, Shannon essentially says, well, you introduce a probabilistic model, then entropy is the answer to this very important problem of compression. So Kolmogorov said, well, if you have a, if you have a specific compressor, a specific algorithm that does compression, then you can classify the complexity of objects just by looking at the length of the output of that compressor. And then you say, well, but this is not very fundamental because then it's just related to that particular algorithm that does compression. Then he said, well, actually, what I'm going to do is allow you to use the best possible algorithm for the object you are trying to compress. Okay? Now, the best possible algorithm always depends on what computational model you are using, but that only is going to add some, a constant. Okay, so he came up with this notion of Kolmogorov complexity, which turns out to be um, quite related to, uh, to entropy when you go to uh, probabilistic sources and so on, but it's, a, it's really a beautiful object. The problem is that you cannot measure it. Uh, unlike entropy and so on, it's a, it's a purely uh, asymptotic um, measure of complexity. There is, uh, there is a school of, uh, in theoretical computer science, there is a school of people who do information theory. They tend to be much less worried about applications than people like us who come from electrical engineering. They tend to uh, worry a lot about problems of interactive communication and so on. And I think it's fair to say that they haven't, they haven't really had a huge uh, practical impact in contrast to the, to the Shannon crowd, who uh, in general is very, very much attuned to what's happening in the real world. Economics, uh, portfolio theory, um, uh, there is also the economics of what they call rational inattention, because they, there is a lot of uh, economical data that cannot be explained by having um, decision makers that are, you know, that have full access to the information. They, they turn, people see that they, they act in uh, ways that are not so rational. So then there has been a model that uh, says, well, People get the information, but they get it through uh, a channel that has finite capacity. So then by, by introducing that into the model, then they are able to explain some of the experimental data that they get. But of course, that becomes more of a social science and so on. And as soon as you put humans into the loop, then it becomes uh, quite nasty. And then bio, uh, now of course, you know, 90% of science now is life science. Uh, and, um, and every time there is more and more uh, push for using information theory for some of uh, biological problems. For example, if you want to do DNA sequencing, then you will want to compress those DNA uh, sequence in, a, in an efficient way, but still those sequences are very far away from having Markov structure or anything. So we really add at the very infancy as to, you know, how to we go about exploiting um, redundancy there. So anyway, I think I'm going to stop here um, and uh, hopefully I have given you a feel for what this field is about and for what uh, Shannon contribu Shannon's contribution was uh, at a time when technology was very much driven by specific problems rather than having an overarching theory. So I think it's one of the great triumphs of uh, that bridges mathematics with the real world. So hopefully some of you will get interested enough to maybe do some reading. And if you're going to start reading something, I would start with Shannon's paper. Thank you very much.
Yes, please, of course. Uh, to your knowledge, do the people who have developed the cell phone network take into account these things? Because as a user, I find that the quality of yes. the sound in cell phone yes. is so much lower than it used to be with oh. standard telephone. So did they take into account this kind of analysis? Or, yes. Or yes. what drives the fact that at the end of the day yes. it's so bad? <laughs> You're absolutely right. And I think what happens is that especially, especially the younger generation um, doesn't give a damn about quality. I mean, I, I see my daughter, sometimes she's watching TV, and I say, do you realize that you can watch this in, in high definition? You're watching it in standard definition. Ah, I don't care, you know. Or one day I, I saw them congregating in the kitchen table, she and her friends, and I'm like, what is that sound? And they were listening to music emanating from a cellular phone, of which to me, I cannot stand it, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think is, um, you know, we could have Skype quality phone calls because, you know, for voice is, you know, uh, what your phone is able to do, downloading very fast data, the voice is not uh, so much of an issue. So I think it has, it's really, a, I think, driven by what the market is demanding. Mm -hmm. And the market every time demands less and less quality. Uh, so that's why they get away. But there is a place where it is especially annoying is when there is an interview of somebody on the radio. Yes. Because the contrast, yes. the standard quality of the radio is so large yes. that it is really annoying. Yes. And I remember there was a time when I was in the scientific advisory board of Orange and they had tried to implement some kind of high quality phone, obviously it was a total failure from yes. the point of view of a uh, market. Yes. And the idea was precisely to provide like journalists or people like that with high quality telephone. Apparently it was a failure. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, again, it is how, how does it fit in, in this? Does it mean that the, the bandwidth is very small, the rate? The no, no, you can, you, I mean, if there, was, if there was a need and if there was a push, you know, that consumers would say, oh, I'm not going to use uh, this uh, company because they, they give you very bad quality. I only want to use something that gives me a Skype quality. If there was such thing, they would all do it immediately because the technology is there. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that you will get, you know, you are, you are in the subway and so on, and you'll, you'll be able to get excellent quality there because the loss of, you, you, you cannot go against the loss of physics, right? You may have a very, very bad signal to noise ratio, and therefore, you know, there are no miracles you can do with that. But, but in normal conditions, we could, have, uh, we could have much better. I mean, even, even the fixed phones sound worse than they sounded 50, they, they 50 years ago. Bec exactly, because it's exactly, exactly. So there is the compression and then there is the, the delay and, uh, and so on. And these vocoders, you know, they, they, have done, uh, they have done a lot of advances and so on, but yet, you know, it's still, it's still going from analog to digital with very limited data rates. So, you know, uh, I don't know whether in the future people, as uh, you know, as technology improves and so on, people will be demand uh, better quality or so. But I think people are getting used to, you know, a lot of it is free. You know, you get YouTube and you, you watch, watch it for free. So then they say, well, you know, if the quality is not that good, then, you know, I'm, I, I'm willing to put up with it. But, um, but yeah, I think that's more, uh, you know, to answer the question is really more driven by, by consumer demand than anything else. It could be true because I remember a story uh, on a radio station. They, they, they say at the beginning when they turned from uh, analog telephone to digital telephone, the quality was so good that when they were interrogating in journalists, from Paris, and the result was in New York. So the quality was absolutely perfect. And people complain, say, it's not possible. The guy is just in the next room. <laughs> so they, they decided to degrade the quality of, uh, of the reception 
to give the feeling that the journalist was truly <laughs> far from the, the from the, the yeah they they do this in New York. Uh, there is a station that every 10 minutes gives you uh, traffic information. So the guy is just sitting in a studio reading it, but then they put this noise of some <laughs> helicopter <laughs> engine so that you can barely hear the guy, because then it sounds like the guy is actually in a helicopter just <laughs> watching the traffic. And there is also comfort noise. Uh, I don't know what you've heard of this. So comfort noise is um, when, um, you know, you're having two-way communication, but uh, so when the other person is uh, speaking, of course, in, in the plain old telephone system, you actually had instantaneous two ways. So you could talk and speak at the same time. There was a decoupling and so on. But in modern systems, of course, um, it's happening um, essentially one at a time. But it's, it's, very, um, it's very annoying if, if when you are talking, you don't hear anything, you, 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 you think, you yourself, yeah, or, or if there is a gap in the conversation and you don't hear anything, you may think like the it has, it has dropped. So that they inject comfort noise. They comfort noise, but it's just, it's just local. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Actually, I was in this information series 30 years ago. Like, the subject, but uh, at the time, we also discussed another question about sphere packing in high dimension. Does it was also upper bound, low bound, and Minkowski bound, and so on. Does it play any role these days? Or? Yeah, of course, because you know, I, I, and it's um, it goes back to uh, what I was saying about um, the Hamming coat that originally people thought, okay, so if we're going to be able to meet Shannon's promise, then we should really go in this route of what we call algebraic coding theory and have these beautiful geometrical designs and so on. Um, but that solves a kind of a problem which is a bit different from Shannon, what Shannon had posed. And indeed, there are, there are very nice mathematical uh, you know, advances and people work on this, but the impact on practice is a bit limited because of that. So the, uh, the great triumph of, of codes has been to get away from that algebraic coding theory and try to, um, to use these codes that have a random component that are demodulated or decoded with, with suboptimal algorithms. And that has been the key. Sorry. So my feeling is somehow that this theory, the information theory, is somehow based on, on uh, thermodynamics. I mean, it's really curious to see this, this uh, entropy, entropy formula mm. in this context. So some people say, actually, Darwin, Boltzmann, Shannon are speaking about the same thing. And actually, Shannon was absolutely not convinced that the term entropy is a good term here. He asked von Neumann about that. Von Neumann answered something like, uh, nobody knows what is an entropy, so call it entropy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's an apocryphal story. Um, even though it has, it has, you know, it has appeared in Scientific American and so on. So what I want to tell you that you mentioned Air Deutsch. Yeah. Air Deutsch is absolutely not thermodynamics. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to tell you that somehow this, this whole thing seems to me a bit marked thermodynamics. It's absolutely not, uh, how can I tell you this? Uh, it's not a modern vision on science. It's somehow the 19th century. Yeah. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm it's not a criticism. Yeah. So, so just because, you know, uh, first of all, let me, let me address the, the issue of von Neumann. Uh, so the apocryphal story is, um, is uh, von Neumann told Shannon uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study that, oh, this object, you should call it information entropy because you will win every argument because nobody knows what information is. And then, um, and then Shannon was asked about it. And then he said, no, I never talked to von Neumann. Uh, you know, he was a big shot. I was just uh, a postdoc there. I really never talked to him. And moreover, 
uh, he didn't really need von Neumann to tell him that that formula was entropy, even in his 1948 paper. It has a reference to a book by Tolman uh, that is trying to come up with a quantum counterpart to Gibbs entropy, and it has exactly the same formula except mm -hmm. without the minus sign. Yeah. So, you know, it goes without saying that Shannon was well aware that that same concept or very similar concepts had been used in thermodynamics. Uh, if you go to Gibbs' uh, book, you find some of the manipulations. In fact, you find uh, special cases of relative entropy also in his work. So from the technical viewpoint, there is some intersections. But what you are absolutely missing uh, between that scientific discipline and this one is that this one is asking questions about information technology. What is the maximum bits, number of bits of information you can send through blah, blah, blah. That is completely absent from there. And also in physics, correct me if I'm wrong, but entropy you cannot measure directly. I think it's something that you, if you want to know what is the entropy of something, then you have to measure temperature, temperature and other things and then plug it into a formula and so on. We can, in fact, you know, w one of those algorithms, like the lempert sieff algorithm, you can apply it to a long text, and then you just count the size of the output. That's going to give you a, a very good estimate of the entropy of that object. So there are, there are indeed uh, differences, and um, important differences. And just because some of the language or some of the alphabet that we use is common, that doesn't mean that there is a lot of overlap between the two. That actually information that is not real, it's not physical, it's something different because, uh, because for instance, energy yes. needs space. Yes, yes. Information doesn't need anything. No, no, you're, you're right, you're right. That is not really physical. Yeah, and some people say the opposite. Mm -hmm. Some say information, uh, uh, you know, information is physical, okay? And uh, so... Well, Yes. Um, we, uh, we were also no. the Lambda words were known for saying uh, people who uh, speak about uh, where does the idea of quantum information come from cite Landauer. Landauer say yes. information is physical, yes. and if the physical object you use to encode information is based on new principle, entanglement and things like that, yeah. then the information should be different. So the yeah, so like, like Maxwell's demon, for example, yeah. one of the explanations is that, okay, so there is information that the demon has to yeah, forget yeah, so and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, now, um, what happens now is that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the analysis of these sparse graph codes now I'm talking ab about a particular technology, the, the technology that has been so successful in, uh, in, um, in getting close to the Shannon limits. It turns out that uh, a lot of the, the methods of proofs and so on that we use to analyze these things are actually enlightened by statistical physics principles. Mm -hmm. Because, exactly. because we, we, you know, we have to look at at ensembles, you know, at uh, from from local properties, we want to uh, derive uh, global properties, and that at the end of the day, you know, we go back to Boltzmann. Yes. Now, but this is this is a comment I wanted to make when you made your, your your comment. The real relationship is about statistics, counting things, mm -hmm. and you can think of statistics in Boltzmann leaving the notion of temperature aside. It's just counting things mm -hmm. and then it's very close to what he explained us today. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I really like you presented the yeah. first page of the paper by Shannon. Mm -hmm. Because the last sentence says, it, it's, it, it's it, italic, the, the bird, the, it's, the bird is meaning. Oh yeah, yeah, that was actually... It, it, it's, it's really uh, important to say. Way. Yeah, 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 it is. Uh, it's a really key point because <laughs> you can you can say today really different methodologies like hyperdimensional computing or mm -hmm. things like that. Well, the encoding has I mean the encoded 
thing has no meaning anymore. Yeah. You understand me? So yeah, he got huge criticism for yeah. this because he's, oh, you know, semantics n play no role. Oh my God, how can this be? Semantics play no role. So especially from science, from social sciences, he get, mm -hmm. and then, oh, information theory needs uh, semantics to be brought in, you know? So, you know, uh, 70 years after it, you know, we're still not, not there yet. But I like this because it's, it's kind of a, a humorous, uh, Humorous thing. Frequently, the messages have meanings. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think less and less frequently. <laughs> it's very important the, the, that actually, as you say, the letter A, letter B, blah blah blah. So this has a real meaning mm -hmm. because the encoding is like that mm -hmm. for things that have meaning. Meaning. So what I want to tell you that we can search in a really different direct direction, different direction. Sorry, you understand me? That mm -hmm. You don't. For the, the, what is the sparse distributed methods? You, you encode it really, for instance, in a hyper dimensional way. You know, you know that, that things, uh, think, uh, think, things has no meaning anymore. Yeah, um, so one place that uh, one finds compression <laughs> and transmission of code nowadays is machine learning, yes. neural networks. Mm -hmm. Is there an information theory analysis on that? Well, a lot of people are trying to, um, you know, machine. Uh, you see, what happens now is that uh, a lot of people who were going into information theory, so we got, you know, we usually got a, a good pool of people, and you know, uh, from engineering schools and so on that were mathematically oriented, they like to do information theory. Now, a lot of that pool is going to machine learning. And uh, machine learning, of course, most of it is very much software oriented and uh, kind of experimentally oriented. But, um, but er there's also a, a nugget that is very much solidly grounded in probability and statistics. And of course, they tend to use some of these tools. But still, we are, we're far away from having uh, a success story like the Lempel-Sif algorithm that I said it's a machine learning algorithm, even though we don't usually think of it as such, but it's an algorithm that is able to learn and then do asymptotically as best, as, as well as if it did not know anything to start with. And that's really what you would like in, uh, so for example, in these deep, uh, deep networks and so on, deep learning, you would like to have a theorem like that, then they would give you some performance guarantee. Right, because for example, when translation happens, and translation is an information theoretic problem, right? From language to language, I mean, you have a code to a code. Yeah. But there's no, there's no analysis from the information theory right. point of view. Right, right. So, so that's, you know, that's, that's really um, what, uh, at this point in time, um, our success story is really the, the toy model. Toy models for us have given us so much mileage. Mm -hmm. we've, we've learned so much thanks to these toy models. Binary symmetric channel, binary ratio channel. You know, once you understand those, then you're almost there. Instead, in machine learning, you know, I guess one day we may get there and say, oh, okay, now we understand the stuff. But now we are really in the dark. Yeah. For the first time uh, with deep learning, the technology comes before the, yeah. the, the theory. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. No, no, no. Like the turbo codes, you know, Glavier and uh, Beru, they had no clue why this was working. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, sure. they, were, they were really... Um, you know, Beru knew some coding theory. Glavier was really more like a computer engineer, I think. And then they had a, a student who was doing a lot of uh, numerical experimentation. They had some very good intuition, but they were completely unable to actually be able to say, okay, it works because of this, or I can analyze it and, and I know. And I think that was very good because the fact that they were willing to do all this experimentation and, uh, and all that, that's excellent. Because in the US, um, coding was very much um, driven by the academic community. And the academic community, you know, a paper like that, you send it to the main journal in the field, it would be rejected because it would be a paper with simulations and all that. The first thing they would say, no, we don't publish these type of papers in the journal. 
but we want to see some results. So uh, a, a lot of people were discouraged from this idea of, okay, let's just experiment and, and so on, because it's just not the way the subject developed. It developed in, in a much more systematic way. But that is also so you had to understand the <coughs> functioning of the brain, for example, because it could be also a link with uh, deep learning. Well, Shannon was very interested in that at some point later in his life. And, uh, you know, there are people who claim, uh, yes, our information theory can help you in that. Honestly, honestly, in 2018? No. 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 Uh, so, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, 30 years from now, we will, say, we will have something to say, but so far, no. Yes. You mentioned about finite block length mm. and some results. Have there been results where there are some limits when we have, uh, but we don't look at the end uses of the channel, but just uh, end uses like the national, but there's a thousand. Yeah. yeah. So have there been results on that field also to see how far you are from some given rate? Or yeah. yeah, so the, these graphs I showed. Um, No, sorry, no, it's kind of slowly. So I, uh, the graph I wanted to show you is, uh, I don't know why it's going so slowly. Capacity. Capacity. Yeah, capacity, capacity of uh, Apple software. So anyway, yes, so the answer is yes. The only thing, uh, the, the only thing, but very important thing, is that in the asymptotics we have nice formulas because you can rely on average quantities like mutual information and so on. In the non-asymptotics, uh, you have to work harder. You don't have a formula. You have upper and lower bounds. And uh, the nice thing is that those upper and lower bounds, we've been able to come up with clever ideas that are pretty tight. But actually what is very interesting is that did I, did I lose already the, I think I, lose, I lost it, anyway. But um, yeah, it's going so slowly then. So the, the, um, the graph I showed, so it had the capacity here, and then there were these two curves that looked like this. So uh, this is, um, so this is rate, and this is block length. So now what happens is that to get, to get this curve, the what we call the achievability curve, the lower bound, we use random coding, the same thing as Shannon. Now random coding, if you think about it, this idea of just using code words that are chosen um, at random, when the block length is high, that's actually going to work very well. But if the block length is very small, like say the Hamming code of seven, block length seven, you don't want to hire a monkey to design your code, right? You want to place those code, those code words very nicely. So what happens is that in this, uh, in this regime, when the block length becomes uh, small, then uh, random coding is no longer optimal. But we don't really know of good tools to come up with optimal codes in that regime. So that's why at that point these curves are becoming vertical. So the, the uncertainty here between the upper and lower bounds is very high. Yeah. So I think that's really one of the of the areas that is going to see more growth in the future about you know how to design systems that work for l uh, smaller block lengths. And then you have, since the block length is uh, smaller, you do have the luxury of then doing a more sophisticated uh, decoding. Uh, but still, you know, you cannot do exponential complexity be because, you know, two to the 100, this is still <laughs> a very large number, so. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we are 45 minutes off the schedule, and I know that you have uh, still the jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was a pleasure, pl pl pleasure to be here. <laughs>